Okay, welcome back to lecture 15, where we're going to do it all in one chunk, and this will be our midterm review. Okay, so the point here is for me to hit just the high points. We're not going to go into depth in anything. I want you to make sure that everything I say sounds familiar, right, and that none of this sounds new to you, and if it does sound new to you, go back and review that lecture, review that section of that book, and review that homework, okay? Okay, so in the beginning, we talked about basic concepts. We talked about our surroundings, we talked about our system, we talked about equilibrium, we talked about units, we talked about temperature, we talked about intrinsic versus extrinsic variables, and we talked about how to build a barometer. We talked about what atmospheric pressure meant, right? We talked, in particular, when we talked about temperature, we talked about the units of temperature, we talked about absolute zero, how we, how we define absolute zero. We talked about temperature scales. Temperature scales. We talked about... Um, Thermometers. We talked about what is temperature, right? How did we define temperature? We talked about our equations of state, in particular for an ideal gas. We talked about various processes. We talked about We talked about um, adiabatic, we talked about isothermal, we talked about isobaric, we talked about isochoric processes, and all should be quasi-static, which means that we're near enough e to equilibrium that we can use our uh, equation of state. One example we didn't do was quasi-static, remember? That was our, our throttling. <clears throat> we defined our work to be uh, minus PD, integral of PdV. Remember our sign convention for work? That if we did compression, then our work was positive. This was work done on the gas. And if we did expansion, then our work was negative and it was done by the gas. We, we looked at our processes along PV diagrams. All right, we did say the isotherm. We did our linear expansion equation of state. Right, for a solid or a, a liquid, we came up with the coefficient of thermal expansion, which was partial L, partial T, constant F, normalized to that. So that was our coefficient of thermal expansion. We had our Young's modulus, which was defined to be 
uh, L over A, partial F, partial L, constant T, which is related to our one-dimensional compressibility. We switch to thinking about three dimensions, and we had our um, bulk our mm, we had our compressibility in three dimensions. Sorry, our coefficient of thermal expansion in three dimensions. So this is dv partial v partial t. 1 over V, and we had our bulk modulus B, which was defined to be minus V partial P partial V constant T. And our compressibility was, proportion, was 1 over V. Which led us to an equation of state, which was dV it's equal to partial V, partial T, and constant P, dT, plus partial V, partial P, constant T, dP. And the point is we could write that down because the volume was an exact differential. Right? <clears throat> Whereas work was an inexact differential, we needed to know the path in it as well. And so we couldn't write this for, for work. So we could get minus beta V dt minus kappa V dp. So remember, we couldn't write the equivalent for work because it was a, a, an inexact differential. But we could write dw as minus P dv. So we could write minus PV beta dt plus PV kappa dp. But you need to know, so you need the path, right, to get the work. You need to do this integral, and you need to know the path you're going. OK, so after talking about our uh, Equation of state for a three-dimensional solid. We went on to um, heat and um, <clears throat> irreversible work or dissipative work, we often called it. We got our first law, right, which was delta U, which is Q plus W, or more often we wrote du is dq plus dw. And the point was that u was an equation of state, right? I mean, a function of state, but q and w were not. This was an exact differential, and those were inexact. We talked about heat capacity. Which was um, partial q or partial t. We talked about specific heat. We talked about molar heat capacity. We talked about CP versus CV for materials, which when would you measure one and when would you measure another. We talked about enthalpy. Enthalpy was uh, H equals U plus PV. And we defined the constant volume uh, heat capacity CV as partial U, partial T, and constant V. And we defined the constant pressure one as partial H, partial T, constant P. We went on and talked about the equipartition theorem equipartition theorem, which was there as a half kBT for degree of freedom. 
And we use the equipartition theorem in part to derive the relationship between CV and CP, which was CP, CP equals CV plus NR. We defined gamma to be the ratio of CP to CV, and that was useful especially when talking about our adiabats. Right? And we had three relations uh, along an adiabat, And PV, so TV to the gamma minus 1, PV to the gamma equals a constant, and T to the gamma, P to the 1 minus gamma equals a constant. Remember that these were for an ideal gas. We did work along adiabats. Go back and make sure you look up that uh, relation. We did a power example. We went on and talked about the atmosphere. Remember in terms of uh, climbing Mount Everest. We talked about the adiabatic lapse rate. We did free expansion. We did <clears throat> kinetic theory of gases. And we had VRMS is equal to the square root of V squared averaged. So allowed us to calculate P, uh, basically our ideal gas law, right? PV equals N, one third NM V squared. So that plus the equipartition theorem led to the ideal gas law. The equipartition theorem. We did an example of the speed of a molecule in the room and how much money is in the internal energy in the room. We went on and did throttling. We did the demo. And what kind of process is throttling? Which one of our processes is throttling? It's isenthalpic. Constant, <clears throat> constant enthalpy. For an ideal gas, that's also isothermal, but we did the demo and it wasn't, right? So this led us to thinking about the hard sphere gas, right? So we took into account the attractions between the molecules. We did the hard sphere gas. Remember where we just said that the potential was basically at some distance d was infinity here and zero there. And that took into account the finite size between molecules. So that reduced the volume by B, and B was approximately the volume of the molar, the molar volume of a liquid. Remember that the hard sphere isotherm was faster an ideal gas, right? So this was hard sphere and this was ideal gas. The isotherm would go faster. And so for throttling, we 
we got H1 equals H2, Cp T1 plus P1B equals Cp T2 plus P2B. Or delta T was B delta P over C. So, <clears throat> doesn't look familiar. Remember, go back and review it. You just rewatch the videos. Then we had to attract, then we had to add attractive part. Right? This only got warming. So then we added the attractive part of our, our, of our potential. And we rewrote P RT. B minus B minus A over B squared. Check the units of A. Make sure you understand that this is reduces the pressure, right? Because the attractive uh, attraction uh, interactions reduce the, the, the momentum, which moves to the kinetic energy, reduces the force on a wall, reduces the pressure. And then we rechecked our free expansion for a van der Waals gas. Remember that for a van der Waals gas, we had CBT minus A over V, and that was resulted in cooling for free expansion. How about for throttling? Well, cooling or warming depended on whether or not we were above or below the inversion curve. Remember we had these uh, lines on the now T versus P diagram, right? So we had some inversion curve. Remember, these were isenthalps. Uh, so this talk, talking, we started talking about the Lindy cycle, the refrigeration of liquid helium. We, we talked about how important the heat exchangers were and understood how we could liquefy nitrogen and hydrogen and then helium, and you had to be below the minimum in the inversion curve. Then we talked about uh, the virial expansion, right? To explain the rest of the curve, right, of phi verse r, we rewrote the ideal gas as an expansion in powers of the molar density. V cubed, yada, yada, yada. And then we said for a van der Waals gas that B was equal to B minus A over RT, and C was equal to B squared for van der Waals. And this led us to thinking about the boil temperature. TB was A over RB. That gate when B equals zero. We talked about the second law quite a bit. That was more recent, so you should hopefully remember. We talked about the Carnot cycle. We talked about <clears throat> adiabats and isotherms, combining them to make the, the Carnot cycle. We asked why was a Carnot cycle consistent with the second law? And it was because there was waste heat. We talked about the efficiency of a Carnot engine, which was work over QH, which was QH over Q minus QC over QH.
which ended up being TH minus TC over TH. And the last thing we talked about then was the efficiencies, right? And we talked about the same for a refrigerator. We talked about A to R. So A to R was um, what we wanted, which was Q. C over work and for a heat pump we had QH over work. And you can rewrite those in terms of QH over minus QC or TH over TC, right? TH and TC. Okay, so we uh, that is everything we did on for this the semester up to this point. So if any of those concepts were unfamiliar, make sure you go back and look them up. And you can also ask questions in the next class. See you then.